Starting out with a bang, your first walk should bring you into the Piazza Navona with its picture postcard perfect Sant'Agnese Church by Borromini and the stunning Fountain of the Four Rivers by Bernini. Two artists that you will encounter several more times in Rome, Bernini and Borromini, as they were the greatest of Baroque architects and sculptors. This centrally located piazza is considered one of the most beautiful and lively outdoor spaces in the world. And you will probably return here several times, for it is interesting night and day. It's a good place to have your portrait sketched or perhaps just buy a scenic original watercolor painting. Originally built as a racetrack by the ancient Roman Emperor Domitian, it still retains the original oval shape that gives it a unique appearance. Piazza Navona is enclosed by faded pastel facades all around that produce a rich feeling of antiquity. Now from the Piazza Navona, walk two short blocks to the best preserved ancient building in Rome, the Pantheon. It's a perfect structure, still standing with its great dome intact after 1,900 years. It was the largest dome in the world until this century and forms a spherical space that creates a balanced feeling of harmony. Its spherical design takes the shape actually of a bubble on a barrel where the height of 140 feet is equal to its width of 140 feet. So it's a dome atop a cylindrical base wall. We'll walk behind now the left side of the Pantheon to another church, Santa Maria Sopra Minerva. It's the only significant Gothic church in Rome. You see the Gothic elements, the pointed arches, and not much in the way of windows. Not much light coming in here because during the Gothic period, they, they hadn't, especially early Gothic, early Roman Gothic like this is, they hadn't really um, developed ways for uh, opening up the walls as much as they did later during the Renaissance. Of course, I, in France in the Gothic, they did have uh, much more windows that we'll see when we get to Notre Dame in Paris. But the, this church is relatively dark, but beautiful side chapels. Now these are in the Baroque style. Inside the church is a mix of Gothic architecture with some decor from the Renaissance and later including one of Michelangelo's relatively crude statues by the altar of Christ holding a cross. And there's a spectacular fresco of the Annunciation on the right side chapel. This is painted by Filippino Lippi between 1489 and 1493 during the Renaissance. And we're going to show you quickly a couple of other churches such as Sant Ignacio. And you don't want to miss this church because of its illusionistic ceiling mural that was painted during the 17th century by the Jesuit priest Andrea Pozzo. It's really quite remarkable to catch the true perspective of the ceiling painting from that central orange round dot on the floor. You have to be standing in the middle of the nave and looking up to see all of the perspective in correct dimensions with the columns going vertically up. Otherwise, when you're standing at the front or towards the back of the church nave, everything seems curved up on the ceiling and bending over and out of perspective. It's one of the great tricks of illusion. San Ignacio is part of the Jesuit College, which is located here. It's the main university for training Jesuit priests and brothers in their mission of educating the world. They're great teachers in colleges and universities throughout the country, Italy, America, Europe, everywhere throughout the world. And this is their main educational center. A few blocks away across the busy Via del Corso, you will arrive at the spectacular Trevi Fountain made famous in various movies such as Three Coins in the Fountain and La Dolce Vita. It is very possibly the world's most beautiful fountain. It depicts Neptune in the center, god of the ocean, being pulled through a triumphal arch by wild horses amidst a torrential cascade of water heralded by a couple of conch blowers blowing conch shells. 
Trevi was built during the 18th century in a Baroque style, but it celebrates the ancient Aqueduct of the Virgin, one of a dozen important waterways that have been bringing water into this city for 2,000 years. The ancient Romans had more fresh water per capita than any modern city, which explains how a million people could live here at the empire's peak several thousand years ago, giving rise to the world's largest city. Notice up above on the wall of Trevi Fountain, yes, it is a wall, it's actually part of a palace behind. On the upper right side, you'll see a square frame with statues inside. It's the Virgin pointing down at the spring from whence this aqueduct came. That's why it's called the Aqueduct of the Virgin. And then on the left side, you'll see another square frame panel, and it shows the engineers who were about to begin construction of the aqueduct. Reputedly, it was Marcus Agrippa, a famous name from ancient Rome, also involved with construction of the Pantheon, who built this aqueduct. Called Trevi because three streets came together here, leading out in various directions of great interest. Continuing walking along in this central part of Rome, we're going to walk from Trevi on over towards the Spanish Steps. Well, here's another good reason for not driving while you're in Rome. Parking is difficult, and if you park in the wrong spot, even with a fancy car, you just might get towed away. It's better to walk. You'll be passing a beautiful structure built by Borromini. He was a great rival with Bernini. And ironically, just around the corner on the facade of this same building is work created by Bernini facing the Piazza di Spagna. Then we arrive at the Spanish Steps. This piazza and the steps are absolutely bursting with people all the time, attracted here by this special combination of wonderful urban elements. The setting is like another painting or postcard come to life with the curvaceous broad staircase elevating your eyes to the twin tower church of Trinita di Monti. And that's accented by an Egyptian obelisk out front. Well, you're probably ready for some refreshments, perhaps some rich Italian ice cream at Giolitti's, one of the city's most famous gelateria. They've got lots of flavors here, and one of the fun ways to approach that is to get some kind of flavor you're not familiar with. Gelato is served at a softer texture than American ice cream, so the flavor really comes through. Passing the elaborate Rococo facade of Santa Maria Maddalena, this little church just two blocks away from the Pantheon is a rare example in Rome of the Rococo style, very elaborate beyond the Baroque. The organ is one of the most amazing in the city, and despite the small size, there is a huge number of decorations, sculptures, paintings, and marble decor packed inside this little church of Santa Maria Maddalena. And that brings our first day to a close. Time to head back to the hotel and get some rest.